Welcome, welcome to the Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts, or rather the virtual Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts. Um, we've made great plans for a 10 day festival early in May. We produced a website, we designed a program, we printed it, and then along came this nasty little virus, which is causing problems <coughs> for all of us and for many people worldwide. And so we had to rearrange things and we're not keen on the word cancel. So we thought there must be another way we can share all these plans, all this writing, all these ideas um, with people. And the part of the festival that lends itself most well to sharing via digital media is of course books and authors and talks about books. So we've concentrated on those. Um, we hope all is well where you are today um, and that we're very pleased that you've been able to join us. So thank you very much. Um, today's book, well, actually, I, I just want to tell you that uh, this event, this event made page three of our program and was going to be the festival's tasty aperitif, a kind of warm up event. In fact, a rather big bookish splash for Swindon, helping to put the town more firmly on the map, or at least uh, the literary map. So we were very excited about this event. We give it a whole page in our program. And in a minute, you'll find out why. Um, it's this book, A Saint in Swindon by Alice Jolly. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's give a Swindon Spring Festival of welcome to Alice Jolly. Alice, welcome. Thank you. Um, and I needn't ask you if you've been to Swindon before because I know you have, is that right? Yes, I have actually. I live not that far from Swindon. I'm in Stroud in Gloucestershire and I've been to the festival before to teach. Um, yes, so um, certainly I have, yes. Well, that's terrific. And we brought you back to Swindon uh, a year ago, actually less than a year ago, 11 months, which is a remarkably quick turnover time for a book to be written and published. Um, so thanks to you and thanks to Fairlight Books for making it happen. Um, but uh, a year or so ago, uh, uh, I was speaking to a friend of ours at the Birmingham Book Festival, Jonathan Davidson, and he told me that I was telling him about how our readers in reading groups often speak about the authors, but they never see them. And he said, oh, we bring the authors to reading groups sometimes. And this gave us an idea. And um, we thought, couldn't we put the two together somehow? And we talked about it a while and we cast about for an author who was brave enough to come and meet um, readers in a reading group who would like to see how a book is produced, be involved in the commissioning process. And do you remember what happened next, Alice? Um, yes, I got a telephone call from you and you said, oh, um, a book group would like to commission a story and would you like to write this story? And I have to say, I was quite surprised because I don't really generally write things that I think book groups particularly like. And I'm not somebody that's very good at writing for a specific market or, you know, if somebody says this is wanted for this, can you write it? That's not really what I do. And so I thought, oh, I'm not sure about that. I don't, don't know that that's the right thing for me. But then I was also extremely intrigued and I was intrigued particularly that this wasn't just about an author turning up to a book group, which actually happens reasonably often, in all honesty. It was about something much more than that. It was about people in reading groups having questions, not just about the book and not, not only about the author, but actually about the publishing process. And in particular, questions about who decides what goes into the book and how is the book produced. And, I did know from my past experience of book groups that a lot of questions of that kind come up. And actually, often those questions can be quite critical. People can sort of say, you know, why does the book have such a terrible cover? Or why didn't an editor tell her to take that whole section of the book out because it's really dull? Or, you know, people have those kind of questions and they know that it's not always just the author who should be answering those questions, that other people have been in on the process. and. 
often people are very interested in that process. And so I thought, well, how interesting not just to go along to a book group for one meeting and just chat about your book and go, but to go along and actually involve people in a book group in the making of a book so that they could see all the different aspects of this. Um, and so, although initially, you know, not certain that it was a good thing for me, I then thought, yes, that's actually really exciting. But it was also really daunting because always in book groups, there are a huge range of different people. And <laughs> the book group I came to visit was absolutely no different. I mean, we started off with quite obvious questions about what kind of book you like and why you like it. And it was fairly amazing how different people's tastes were. And Absolutely. on the one hand, I was really excited and I thought, isn't that wonderful, all these enthusiastic readers. But on the other hand, some part of me was absolutely quaking because I was thinking, well, wait a minute, how am I going to sort of cover all these kind of different preferences and these different ideas? And uh, you came to Swindon, um, which is a place where we run a project called Arts, Words and Literature Development and it's linked to our wonderful library service. And uh, we use it to promote reading and writing and storytelling and so on. And so we put the word out that you had said you were brave enough to come. Um, and so members of the more serious uh, reading groups in Swindon came along to Lowershaw Farm and met you that evening. And uh, do you remember what happened? They sat around in, in a circle sort of around you and you were at, at one edge of the circle and uh, you had a notepad out and you were quiet and cautious I would say. Yes I mean mainly I was making lots of notes because oh. I was trying to think what is it that they want, what appeals to them, what sort of story might they like um, and also I suppose I was a little bit nervous because people in book groups can be very frank with authors which is great. I mean, you shouldn't be an author if you're not prepared to have people be frank about your work and sometimes people don't like what you do and it's, it, it's fine and it's good to have quite an open debate. But because I didn't know them, I was thinking, oh, yes, I'm just trying to sense what kind of thing they like. But I think the thing that was really exciting was immediately people kind of came up with ideas of the sort of things that it could be about. And then I remember very specifically a lady starting to tell a story um, and I remember thinking, wait a minute, yes, she's got it. That's probably what it is. And I also remember that we had discussions about whether it should be a Swindon story or not. And actually people were a bit divided on that, I think. But I felt quite strongly from the beginning, these people have come along to help me create this. It should be about their town. And I also wanted it to be about their town because it's quite a unique project. And also because there are a few stories set in Swindon, but it's not the obvious place that writers think about setting a story. And so, yeah, I wanted to give people a story about the place that they, that they came from. Um, and I also was interested in the book group idea because initially I thought I didn't want to write a story that was about a book group, but actually, because it is for a book group, that became a very natural sort of structure for the story to, 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 to follow. So, but what was great that evening was that there were so many ideas and so much enthusiasm. No, absolutely. And, and you went away with those notes uh, and we, we, we met in June and you went away and three months later you came back to us. And I remember the opening line of your email, you said the, um, the, so the story had got longer did got more than and you were slightly apologetic that it was no longer a short story um what, what what happened i mean i was delighted once i read it but what happened um i suppose i just got going on it and i found more than i thought um and also it went off in directions which i hadn't initially thought that it would at all um i think actually it was very liberating for me because it's quite difficult for writers sometimes the short story overall seems to have got shorter in particular um, publications and competitions often want short stories of 3,000 words or less which is a very short story mm -hmm. um, and I often find that frustrating and I more often write stories that are 5,000 words or 6,000 words but then it's problematic to get those published because people don't want longer stories so I think the publishing industry is quite narrow you know there are sort of recognized things there are short stories which have to be short and novels which probably got to be over 80,000 words and until recently there were very very few novellas 
Mm. Um, and certainly the long, short story is something that writers don't really write because there's no place for it. Um, so it was actually exciting for me to think, actually, you know, yes, this can be really quite a long, short story. Why not? Because I'm free to do that. I'm not sort of constrained in, in my thinking here. No, absolutely, Alice. Now we come to the we come to the book itself, and so so the short story became more like novella length. Um, uh, the, the book is uh, oh, eighteen, nearly ninety pages, so it's it's quite a, a substantial story, um, and remarkable that it was written uh, nine months ago, and yet has many elements in it, many strands in it, that are really about now, about the way we are living now. I mean, what do you think of that, Alice? How, what, what foresight? I mean, how can we talk about it now without, um, because this is not a private conversation, there are people watching and listening, um, without giving away um, too much of the story or any spoilers, um, how, can we, how can we point people to its absolute relevance and its absolute um, significance in today's climate? Um, with the coronavirus around us, um, without giving anything away. Have you any ways of... <laughs> I yeah. want to tell them all. <laughs> well, I, yes, I think it was very strange. I must say that um, I received an actual copy of the book two or three days ago, and I probably hadn't actually really looked at it for two or three months because we'd finished off the editing and all of that. And I had been thinking, oh, that book's become a bit more relevant than it was. But when I opened it up, I did get a shock because I did think, oh, this was almost as though I knew something was going to happen. I think um, quite a lot of the book was written um, in France over last summer, and it was far, far too hot there. It was, I mean, you know, it, it, France obviously is hot in the summer, but it, there was a kind of anger to the heat that, that was worrying. And I think like everybody for ages, I'd been noticing, you know, things changing and sort of worrying about, about these kind of issues. And so, yes, I mean, I won't say exactly the way the, in which the book is relevant, but certainly people finish up confined and shut in and lacking all sorts of things. And it becomes really about what the written word does for you in that situation. But one thing I was very conscious of is I didn't want to write another one of those slightly wishy-washy books about, um, oh, isn't reading good for you, you know. Um, I actually slightly hate that kind of attitude. I sort of hate that sort of eat your greens kind of attitude for reading. I mean, I think we should just read because it gives us pleasure and it's fun and interesting and takes us into new worlds and spreads ideas. I do think all of those things. But um, so actually, my starting point wasn't really about, oh, aren't books wonderful? It was more, aren't books dangerous? Mm. Uh, and, and actually, are books really about distraction? Um, and in fact, if we're lost in a book, have we failed to notice other things we should have noticed? And so this is very much not a book um, about, oh, we're all in a bad situation and a good book's going to help us. There's something sort of darker and more questioning, I think, about um, all the different things the written word can do for us, some of which are actually not very positive. No. Um, and before we actually come, and I, I do want to tell people a little bit about what the book is about, but before we come to that, um, in your afterword in the book, there's uh, a couple of paragraphs which I think could almost be the foreword in that it, it's, it's very much, it shows how you think about being a writer. And what I loved about it is uh, the role you think that the reader plays, um, which bearing in mind a reading group was involved in this, is quite a compliment to readers. Would you mind reading that to us, Alice? Yes, I, I certainly will do. And yes, it is very much a compliment to the reader. And I'm somebody that believes passionately in readers because as a writer, your clay that you're working with is the imagination of the reader. You provide them with a few details and a few bits and pieces, and then they make the book. If it's a good book, there's enough gaps for, for them then to come into the creative process. And that's always what I want to do, which I think, as you say, this little passage perhaps slightly captures. We were also all reminded that the simple act of reading is a truly amazing process. It is both intensely solitary and amazingly sociable. The reader not only encounters the writer, he or she also meets all the characters who inhabit the story. 
Beyond that, the reader also engages with all the other people who have read the story who, or who might read it in the future. The writing is remade again and again as it is considered. I am thrilled that this story, which we created together, will now have a wider audience. And no, I'm not going to tell you what you should think about it. The white space is yours, and I know you will fill it with your own questions, thoughts and images. Welcome to the conversation. Make this story your own. Enjoy the magic and the danger of the written word. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. The magic and the danger of the written word. And yet, um, as well as magic and danger, it does need a story. And I'm not going to give everything away, but I do just want to tell viewers that this is about a story. This is a story about a man who comes to town, goes to a B and B, goes to his room, and reads, and wants more books, and spends quite some time there asking for more books, and. Uh, what's interesting about that is not only the books he reads, and by the way, um, there's a book list of the books he reads and the books that others read. So not only can you enjoy a great story here, but you can you can create or you can have a reading list for yourselves. And uh, and if ever there was a readers group book, this is it because there's so many things to discuss and argue about in it, and also you end up with a reading list as well. Um, but what I was going to say was that um, just a man staying in a room reading creates a stir around town. Um, and it's bizarre why, but it's very believable. Um, people come and camp out around the B&B. &B. Um, there's a buzz around town. Um, people wonder who he is. Um, why, why, if a man does nothing, but hide away and read books. Is such a stir created, Alice? Well, I think actually, um, just sitting reading a book, um, certainly until two or three months ago, was quite a subversive activity because we're in this world where people are rushing, they're trying to achieve things, they're, you know, they're constantly busy um, and so on. And so just that act of spending all day reading, I suddenly thought, Yes, that actually is quite subversive. But I think the main thing as well is that they know nothing about him. And that in a sense is quite dangerous because, and it mirrors what I've just been saying about books themselves, that if we're not given enough information, then almost naturally we start filling in the gaps and he becomes a sort of screen onto which everybody projects a lot of stories they would like to tell. Um, and he's actually like a vacuum at the center of it all. Um, but they are, um, you know, increasingly and, and, uh, inventing stories about him. So yes, there's a story behind how this book was made and then there was a story of the book, but in it, there's also the characters who are telling stories about this man. And I think that's about, yeah, storytelling as a way that we understand the world when we can't, a way of filling in gaps and, um, and also of creating wonderful fantasy worlds and imagining all sorts of things happening that aren't actually happening. So um, yeah, the imagination I think is very important here. And I think probably, you know, over the last sort of 10 or 20 years with the rise of the internet, that's slightly been forgotten. And so people are attracted to him and they, they do have a story often the story actually says more about them than it does about him, but they nevertheless have projected their story onto him. Yes, and there's a passage somewhere where you say, how can you know about the world without reading? Um, which is a fascinating question. Um, I mean, there are many ways of knowing about the world, but there's something about reading. Um, you also managed to weave into the story all sorts of other things about life. For example, what it's like when a government instructs the people to behave in a particular way more than they usually do which is all right we like governments we don't want uh, we, do, we don't want uh, disorder um, we don't want uh, chaos but so governments are good things in that sense but when governments are giving too many instructions then people behave in certain ways and there's a certain a certain tension there between what one character thinks about what the government doing and another character thinks and then there's the local committee and so on then you also weave into it an affair which is sort of yeah, it, it, 
we sort of know a bit about it and then we know more about it and then we know less about it. Um, and, and characters change within it. So it's, it's remarkable how in such a short, long story, a lot is going on. And, and you set it in, in 2030, don't you? So 10 years hence, um, or, or 2035 it becomes. Um, um, did you feel it becoming a novel because of all ah. these different strands? I don't know that I did, but I think that what I know is that it doesn't really matter whether you're writing 3,000 words or 300,000 words. Um, every character in the story needs a journey. If, if somebody doesn't change to some extent in the story, then they probably shouldn't be there. Um, and so every character did have to be fully fleshed out and you then have a lot of decisions as to what exactly you're going to put in and, and what not because you, I actually didn't want all of that stuff in the book but I think it's interesting with writing it's very much that sort of tip of the iceberg berg thing that yes you create characters with huge stories and you know absolutely all about them you may then put them in as only relatively minor characters but because you've sort of done all that work then hopefully they come over as very real so um, yeah, I think in a way, there's always that work to be done, no matter what the length of the story is. Yeah. Um, and you even wove into the story uh, the role of libraries. Um, I can't remember bookshops, but, but certainly libraries, but we do want people to get these from bookshops when they reopen. They can certainly get it online from Waterstones, Blackwells and others um, online. Um, but um, um, you, I mean, this isn't necessarily about Swindon, yet it's called a saint in Swindon. And by the way, um, it's not clear quite who the saint is. It strikes me, but again, this is not a spoiler, and this is for reading groups to discover, discover or, or individuals who read it, but it could, it occurs to me, it could be any one of three. Do you want to say any more about that without um, giving anything away? Yes, I think um, that's right. Um, and I think there's a question behind that as to, to who a saint is or what a saint is. And there's one person who could possibly be the saint, but he actually, um, you know, is the reader. And actually, we, nobody really knows anything about him. So they've sort of made him a saint, but they don't know who he is. And then there's another person who would like to be a saint. And again, has all the sort of trappings of being a saint. But then the third person in the book I think the suggestion is that actually being a saint is something slightly different. Um, and that actually, again, probably our society has spent too much time valuing people who are quite high profile, who have got quite a lot to say or who draw people to them. And I think I wanted to celebrate more those people who perhaps we don't even particularly like or perhaps are a bit dull or whatever, mm. but actually, when it comes to it, they achieve things, they get on with things and they're stable and they survive difficult situations and contribute. And so I think that is actually a very interesting question. And I think it's a question about what we value. And again, it makes the book relevant to current times where suddenly all sort of whole, whole professions have become actually utterly irrelevant. And um, jobs and activities which seemed a little bit lowly and not so interesting are suddenly seen to be incredibly important. So again, I couldn't have predicted that when I wrote the book. But yes, I think that question of who actually is a saint is very important to the book and, and to our current times. Yeah, I mean, when I was reading it, um, I thought of uh, a passage at the end of Middlemarch where um, the author points out, Elliot points out that um, smaller characters can be doing heroic things, uh, ignored ones, and also a poem by U.A. Fanthorpe called Atlas, where she talks about the person who knows where the WD-40 is and the person who can fix things, what a heroic role they play in family life. And often they're not necessarily the personality who's up front. So there's a question of saintliness and who is a saint and so on. And, uh, uh, and we get some of that in this story too. Um, um, I want to I, wa I want us to finish um, with a reading, um, and uh, I did want to just mention that um, it, it's set in Swindon, but it's not all about Swindon. But I was about to say before that I was very pleased that you mentioned the place where most of the books were got 
for this person who wanted to read. Have you ever been there? Uh, yes, I have, because I did um, a reading um, in that library um, for, for the festival. And um, it was very exciting because before that I hadn't been to the library. And it's actually, it's actually a completely fantastic building. And it was also lovely to meet the staff there and showed what we know of how vital libraries are and how important some of this sort of outreach work that they do is. Um, so yes, I definitely wanted the library to be a part of it because again, you know, libraries are something that's been slightly overlooked and underfunded and lots of them have been closed and whatever. Um, and again, I think we're sort of in the process of rediscovering why libraries matter. So yes, it was very important to me that the library should be part of it. I could actually tell you've been there because it was perfectly accurate, the spiral staircase and so on. So anyone who reads this book and wants to check, um, there's a lot of accuracy um, in the book. Um, so, but anyway, people can check that for themselves. Um, let's finish, Alice, with a reading from you. Um, by the way, there's lots of humour in the book as well. So I don't know whether us chatting about it has given any of the viewers any sense of the humour. But um, it, it's, very, it's very funny in places. But you're going to end with a, with a, a bit, I hope, a, a reading that uh, now that we've been singing the praises of books, that maybe, maybe questions their role. Um, Alice, maybe you'd like to finish a reading. Yes, I think this is um, comes towards the, the end of the book. And as you say, it's about, um, you know, is, re is reading such a wonderful thing or should we be a bit careful? So, so much that happened was the fault of the book's reading, empathy. Perhaps there are some points of view we should not try to understand. You read books and you copy behaviour that shouldn't be copied. You speak in words that are not your own. You think you are powerful. You become a messiah in your own mind. Books make us think that we can change, but we can't. We just become more of what we always were. We tell the same stories over and over again. We do not learn lessons. The world is not a puzzle that we can solve. Alice, thank you very much. Um, a saint in Swindon, who's the saint? Get the book and find out. Um, and especially, I mean, now's the time to read it. I've said that before and I'll say it again. But also, it's a good book to read anytime, especially if you're a member of a reading group. Reading groups will have great fun with this book. Um, I promise you that. Um, could, thanks could very much. Yes, Could I say one last thing, Matt, sure. which I think is very important is that I would like to thank the lovely people of the Swindon Book Group that came along at those evenings and who actually edited. And I was amazed by how what a positive and great experience that was and what fantastic ideas they had. And also incredibly respectful and willing to also realise the limitations of the creative process, um, which is sometimes harder than the excitements of it. And so you know, we're talking about this as though it's my book. Well, actually, it, it isn't my book. Um, those people, and you yourself as well, were absolutely key to this. So, um, yes, I would like to thank all the people that helped to make the book because it, it was very much a joint effort. Alice, thank you, Alice, thank you very much. Maybe we've, we've set a, a model for future books to be produced with authors working with reading groups. Um, that would be nice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can get this book online and elsewhere. Um, there are other events, virtual events happening at the Swindon Spring Festival. Look out for them on our website. But for now, we must stop. But we'd like to end by giving a Swindon Spring Festival thank you to Alice Jolly. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you. Thank you for uh, watching this virtual session at the Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts 2020. We do hope you enjoyed it. And we also hope that you will join us for the rest of this virtual festival. Here for you are details of the author you have just watched, their book and our online information. Thank you very much for joining us and keep well till we meet again. <laughs>